This month on CityCast Portland, we're interviewing candidates running to be the next mayor of our city. And today on the show, we're talking to our second candidate, Leave Austis. You might also know her by the stage name Viva Las Vegas. She's an iconic Portland stripper, as well as an outspoken sex workers advocate. She's a published author and has been a fixture in the local music and art scenes since planting roots in Portland after graduating from Williams College in 1997. And today on the show, we're talking to her about why she thinks she's fit for the job. It's Tuesday, June 18th. I'm Claudia Meza, and this is what Portland's talking about. You know, you talk a lot about transforming empty buildings and storefronts around town into space for artists. If you were given a space right now, what would you do with it and how would you design it? Wow. Hardball questions right off the bat. I love it. Um, well, so when I see the zombie buildings is what we're calling them downtown, I mean, a lot of them are really unappealing um, skyscraper structures that, I don't know, most they say that they're uninhabitable. That's what the people who own them say that they're not suitable for living in. I say, I maintain that artists can and do make things beautiful wherever they go, and they they have the creativity to find a way to make those habitable. So I would turn it over to the artist. I'm not a designer myself. I would say, here's a building. We're going to test drive it. Let's get a team of imaginative artists who do have engineering chops, uh, work with permitting people, um, and let's see what, what that group can design and imagine. And I think most so much of my campaign is about imagination and then finding practical ways to get those ideas birthed. Mm -hmm. I do want to say that um, that was the most softball question. That oh, I shoot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Well, I mean, if it was your building, though, like you were going to live there, like how would you design it? Like I'm curious, like okay. just the, the outside, inside, yeah. anything. Well, you know, my whole life I designed loft-like buildings. I always thought I watched fame growing up. I always wanted a big, <laughs> raw studio space. Totally. That in my imagination would be next to free. And then those spaces became very popular and, and condoized. So, I, yeah, big, empty space. I would put up a dance bar. I'd put up a pole, obviously. I'd get some beautiful Moroccan rugs. I would make sure to have a a hearth-like gathering space, like Frank Lloyd Wright. I mean, not with an actual hearth, but a place where people gather around to share ideas. Um, I would take down as you know any walls that weren't necessary to make sure that people could be together and could move and you know, dance to the space. I would get plants and I and mirrors to reflect the light. Uh, I think reflecting light in metaphorical and literal ways is really important. It's another facet of my campaign. <laughs> That's the coolest mayor's office of all time already. <laughs> <laughs> Stripper pole. So good for upper body strength. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you had to just pick one thing that you think isn't working in Portland right now, what would it be and how would you fix it? Our narrative. I, When I decided to run for mayor, I was looking at the other candidates, um, with the exception of maybe one. They were all talking very darkly about Portland and a very pessimistic narrative. There are still wonderful things about Portland happening in Portland. And the more we belabor the dark narrative, the more that that's how the rest of the nation sees us and how we see ourselves. And yes, we have significant challenges, but I think just in shifting that narrative as a storyteller, as a, a person who's an optimist, um, I think that that, could, that is critically important. People need hope right now, most of all the people suffering downtown without housing and in the addiction spiral. They need hope too. And I think Hope is, hope comes cheap, actually. How would you create that hope or change that narrative then? In the most basic way of, of presenting it on the podium as the mayor to Portlanders, to the nation. That sounds pretty naive and Pollyanna-ish, but I, I do think that's called for. And then to have um, artists bring the beauty and the music and the ideas have those artists centered downtown and have that energy spread out. I definitely, you know, I have plans for addiction services as much as the city is responsible for or is allowed to be a player in that realm. I, I have thought about the bigger issues more, but I 
the fundamental pillars of my platform are to bring hope through through arts and by by that I also mean, you know, affordable housing and also the environment. I didn't see really an environmental candidate and I think it's a critically important time. We we all know this that it's time to think radically differently about the environment and to center that in every decision that we make. And I think a lot of hopelessness comes from climate change and from just being feeling so powerless. Our river is terribly polluted. The, the infrastructure hub down in Linton is ready to become the worst environmental disaster in U.S. history, and we're just doing nothing about it. We know these things, and we sit with it. We feel it in our hearts and souls, and that creates despair. So address these things. Talk about the gift of our beautiful river, the gift of our beautiful forests, the gifts of our imagination and our community. And that's what I want from our mayor. (laughs) And I don't see it. So I'm running. (laughs) Yeah. And let's talk about that. Like you've never held an elected office before and um, you very clearly call yourself an artist over everything else. Um, And I feel like that's a, a big reason your supporters are excited is because you just, you seem like a Portlander who who wants to be mayor. I, what made you decide to run for mayor? Well, did I want to become mayor? Did I want desperately to have these um, ideas focused on in the mayor conversation? I saw a lack of leadership, obviously, in the last couple terms, and a lack of vision. And I think we all need to step forward and talk more about our ideas from our communities. My my art artist friends are getting pushed out of Portland. You know, it started a long time ago, but it's speeding up radically with the lack of affordable housing. With the new form of government that we've voted in, I think that's a really exciting time to reimagine what politics, what what service is going to look like in Portland. And as I'm campaigning and seeing all the candidates for city council, I, the energy is amazing. These people are such dedicated public servants and they have the chops and the imagination. And I think just approaching this new form of government has energized people so so much. And I saw a platform that I thought my voice would resonate upon and that my gifts of just connecting across the aisle to many and varied communities that that would serve Portland well. And, you know, maybe I really didn't want to do this. In fact, I resisted a lot coming to this decision, but eventually it was harder not to do it than to do it. And I, yeah, I really appreciate (sighs) Um, just being able to have these hard conversations and to bring different parties to the table and talk about what could be different. We have to do things differently. It's so clear. And a lot of the messages I'm hearing from other mayoral candidates kind of are along the same narrative that's always been and let's let's change it <laughs> right you know you've also called out city commissioner mingus maps as a mentor of yours absolutely he's part of the city council that you're seeing a lack of leadership with mm-hmm. yep <laughs> so it's true yeah i'm curious how is he mentoring you to do something different well when i say mentor um to me that means this is somebody who I know socially as a friend and who, when I was deciding whether or not to take this path, sat down with me for coffee, encouraged me, told me the basic nuts and bolts. I don't think he and I, I mean, we're probably closer than we are far apart politically, but the path he's taking is is different than I want to take. Like he's a very kind, compassionate, liberal, you know, person with an academic background like me, but who's kind of working within the system to change the system and using those those tropes. And mm-hmm. I'm saying, like, let's maybe burn it down and start over. Maybe not burn it down, but let's do things differently. But Mingus is one of um, six or seven people I sat down with and had coffee with, people who had run for mayor like Sean Davis, Bim Ditson, people who are going to run for mayor but haven't declared yet. Ooh, top secret. I really was nervous about what this path was going to do to my life and what the drawbacks were, safety-wise, for instance, but also wanted to know why the heck would anyone do this? Mm -hmm. And to a person, Mingus, Bim, Sean, they all just said it was the honor of their lives to engage with the community in this way. And that really surprised me just jaw to the floor, surprise, like, oh, this is an honor? Like, people screaming at you all the time and and claiming you did everything wrong. 
And yet you feel so honored to be in that space and to be working for people. That that really impressed me. And I sat with that for eight months and finally jumped in. And I have to say, it's true. <laughs> mm-hmm. What do you think makes you more prepared for the role of mayor than some of your opponents who are current city commissioners or even CEOs running large operations? Mm, um. I believe that I have vision. I am a visionary and that this is a time of where radical change is called for. I am connected throughout this community in many various parts of Portland. Uh, that's what we do at the strip club is we connect with everybody. Mm-hmm. Every voice is heard there as long as they're over 21. Um, but I'm also connected to the, the eight-year-old community through my daughter. Um, but I, I think it's time for a leader like that, the new form of government that the mayor will have quite a different role and will be hiring a city administrator. There are big players working alongside the mayor. So in my mind, the mayor can be more of a visionary in this new form of government, can be a leader who speaks with optimism about Portland and lets the harder work of really fixing things that are seriously broken um, fall to the bureaus where that work should be done and where the experts are working within. Yeah, you you bring up um, relying heavily on experts, you know, the expertise of others uh, on city council to get things done if elected, you know, because of this Mm -hmm. new form of government. But how will you decide on who's the right fit for the city administrator, police chief, and city attorney, since that will be your job in the upcoming charter change? Well, I'm not going to be hiring those people unilaterally. You know, certainly I'll have a team with me to to vet and interview and ultimately select those key players. Um, but I do think I am an expert at connecting with people, at communicating with people, at comforting people. Um, when I think of great leaders, I see people who really can connect across great divides, and that is critically important for this juncture in our history as a nation, as a city. Um, and to really listen to different ideas and find the commonality. That is my area of expertise. And that is what I want from all of our leaders right now. And you know, leadership didn't always look like people with MBAs or people with law degrees. Leadership was matriarchy. Leadership was you know, very different historically. And I have a cultural anthropological background and I'm ready to see very different people lead. Let's have artists lead. Let's have spiritual leaders lead. Mm -hmm. Let's try it. All right. Well, let's take a quick break here. And when we return, more with Portland mayoral candidate Leave Austis. So your platform states that centering the arts and having a hopeful outlook, as you've been saying, will help in addressing ongoing issues in Portland, like the housing and addiction crisis. But what's the actual plan there? Like, how will you ensure this will actually happen with all of your positive messages? Mm-hmm. Well, so in terms of the the housing crisis, we're, we're looking into how are those zombie buildings, does the code exist to re-inhabit those, to make those low-income housing spaces? And I and reached out to Randy Leonard. We had coffee and he said the the code exists right now. They could be reconfigured as housing right now. It's not nothing that you'd have to um, change existing code to do. So just, just right there, like figuring out pragmatically how is that possible in terms of like addiction and the healthcare realm. So that largely falls to the county, as we all know, and the city and the county has been in a scruff for a long time. I'm trying to figure out what levers the city has in, say, accessing state dollars or or coordination from the state level or even the federal level. Learned a lot from Central City Concern, who is you know one of the federally funded addiction resource centers. Like, how do we, how can the city be a better player in the addiction crisis? What are our avenues as a city? And certainly we have to repair the relationships. It's it's ridiculous that a relationship between the city and the county can cause so much, a, fa- a failing relationship between those two entities can 
cause such despair and death. You know, that's get over it. <laughs> we got to we got to get those parties back at the table. And I think ideally like a top down from the state level to coordinate those resources throughout the state because Roseburg has a terrible housing crisis. Roseburg has a terrible fentanyl crisis. The coast is suffering terribly, but all of these services are working very independently, oftentimes against each other, don't even have databases. I've been really impressed with a lot of the news coverage that um, calls that to our attention, that those people suffering downtown, they there's not even a database to keep track of what's been going on with them and which services have been tried and where those services have failed them. There's a lot of places where we can mend this torn fabric. And yeah, I have a lot of ideas. Yeah, what, <laughs> what, what are like? But what will you do? I guess is the question, and I under, totally understand that you know the housing crisis—that's a big deal. But I'm just saying, within the power as the mayor, what will you do? Well, try to agitate for coordination from the state. Make sure that the relationship between the city and the county is repaired. Make housing available downtown. Like there's all those empty buildings. Like try whatever we can to make sure that those are available for low income housing. Make sure that the the jobs that are available are appealing to people. That they they are have competitive wages and benefits like peer support services. That's a really important part of this addiction um, healing narrative. Uh, make sure that nurses can afford to live here. Make sure that our public safety component is compassionate, is robust, ideally lives in Portland, can afford to live in Portland, and wants to live in Portland. So there's many ideas in how, how we actually affect those ideas. I, you know, again, listening, reaching across the aisle, trying to find areas of commonality to, to make this a conversation and not just shut down. Mm-hmm. One of your biggest uh, platforms, as you mentioned, is, you know, the environment, uh, earth stewardship, and specifically looking at the equal and intentional distribution of PSEF dollars or the Portland Clean Energy Fund. Can you give us an example on like, how you would approach these priorities? Well, in terms of the environment, I think, like, number one priority, the can that's been kicked down the road for decades, we've got to figure out what to do with the... Um, CEI hub that's down on Lint in Linton and that part of the river, it's built on unstable infill and it's going to dump millions of gallons of fuel into the river, even with a, a moderate 5.0 earthquake. That has to be addressed. I think if the new mayor did one thing in their term, if that were it, that would be great. Like we're talking generations of people mm -hmm. and, you know, not just people, our environment. So that is a critically important part of my platform. And then the more equitable distribution of PCEF dollars, shade equity out in East Portland, uh, making sure that people have shelter, water, food during these climate crises, whether it's an ice storm or a heat dome. We There are so many Unused churches, for instance, where I'm thinking, like, can we make those into community sites where, where people know that they can go and they can access food and water and air conditioning or heat when those things happen? Um, just trying to network and imagine ideas that are practical, easily Im implementable, because we're going to need that in two months. We're going to need that again in six months. We need those things urgently. So give those PCEF dollars to kind of do an emergency coordination to make sure that there are facilities open immediately mm -hmm. because these crises are coming. Right. So if, if you could get just get one thing done. It'd be the CEI hub. Move, like make sure that the that, that is more stable. It's not going to pollute our river. I, you know, I, I love our current generation. We're great, but I want to make sure that seven generations from now they still have a beautiful home. Mm -hmm. You know, stretch goal. I'd love to see the salmon come back up the Willamette in the Columbia. That that is a barometer of health to me. I am a visionary. I want a balanced world. I, I even out on the campaign trail. I've even met developers who are talking about circular economies. These ideas sound radical, but it's it's time for them. We're in such a crisis climate wise that it's time to think radically and act radically. Mm -hmm. 
Would you yourself think that you are a pretty long shot bid for mayor or are you pretty sure that you have a <laughs> very good chance of winning? I'm curious what, what you think. What I think, you know, <laughs> I've been told by many people in many different quadrants of the city that they see this as a a battle for the city's soul against me and one other candidate. And I I see that. It's a lot of pressure on me. I want to be, I want to win Portland's soul. And I'm in it as much as I can be to win it. Personally, when I look at my schedule and I'm, you know, working so hard at shift work and I'm not able to attend some of these endorsement interviews, I get I get pretty sad and overwhelmed. I'm like, I I could fight this battle and save the city's soul, but I need, you know, I need time and I need funding. And our campaign funding has been pretty robust considering we've been in it for three months, but I'm still slogging away at Mary's, which I love and bunk. And just sometimes I'm like, wow, if I if I had an extra hundred grand to bankroll a couple years off and to hire a campaign manager and to really do this properly, I would win. I know I would win. So hey, everybody who's listening to CityCast, if you if you know any like pro bono campaign managers or field directors, we can win this, but I need those people to appear now. And we've had great volunteers appear at every juncture we need them, but we kind of need those big deal big paycheck ones, and we don't have the funds in our campaign to pay them just yet. Well, I'm ending every one of our interviews, our mayoral candidate interviews, with the same question. Um, so like you, I used to you know, play in bands, and I don't know, did you go on tour with your bands? Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. So you know how it is when you go on tour, mm-hmm. how you kind of miss like this one thing from your city. Mm. For us, it was always salad. We're always just like, I just want a salad. I just want to go to New Seasons and I want to eat a salad. Oh my I'm gosh. curious, like, what was the thing you missed the most when you left Portland for work, you know, or vacation? Oh, interesting. Interesting. <laughs> I mean, I always had the reverse thing where the second I got over the clouds, I was like, oh my God, there's blue sky up here. <gasps> I can breathe. <laughs> but what did I miss about Portland. I mean, the the feeling of being in a rainforest and all the secrets passed amongst the trees. Like my band played in Copenhagen and you know, took the boat to Stockholm and or Malmo. But um, I I miss the forests and I live on Mount Tabor and I'm out there every day just absorbing messages from the the dirt and the worms and the trees and the bald eagles and the crows. Um, so I would say that that. That fecundity, that being in a, a rainforest. And I thought you were going to ask me what my campaign song was going to be. And I wanted to tell you, it's the Neo Boys, Rich Man's World. <laughs> oh, wait, Rich Man's Dream, Rich Man's Dream. <laughs> but you should ask every— I really should. That is such a good idea, Leave is everyone's <laughs> campaign song. Oh, my God. You, yep. We're going to make sure that we'll reach out to the only other person we've— interviewed so far and ask him that question. Okay. And then let me like, set you up. Lee. Let me set you up. Yes. Okay. Well, final, final question. <laughs> if you had to choose a campaign song, what would it be? Rich Man's Dream by Portland's Neo Boys. Absolutely. <laughs> Why? <laughs> I love that band. They they don't have as much notoriety as like the Wipers. They're from, I'd say the late 70s, early 80s. I think it was a f- female trio. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of a lo-fi punk, reminds me of the Satyricon, speaking truth to power in kind of a poetic and kind of perverse way. I I, I just, I want a Neo Boys shirt and I think I'm going to have to screen it myself. I don't think they are out there. But I'm going to Second Avenue later to see. <laughs> <laughs> well, Leif, thank you so much for taking time out of your really busy schedule. I know that, you know, working two jobs, you're a single mom, you're also running for mayor. So thank you so much for taking this bit of time to chat with us. We appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be on again. Have a great day. Yeah, and good luck. Thank you. (laughs) 
just a quick note that we'll be off this Wednesday in observance of Juneteenth, so we won't be showing up on your feed. But we will be back to our regular schedule on Thursday with our next mayoral candidate interview, which is with Commissioner Renee Gonzalez. So be sure to tune in for that conversation. Also, check out our show notes for a link to events happening in celebration of Juneteenth. We hope everyone has a safe and happy holiday. Well, that's all for today here on CityCast Portland. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back tomorrow morning with more from around the city. Until then, see you at Slim's. <laughs>